Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Part two for, for the pastors to become brutish. We're going to pick off where we left off. Okay, we talked about for pastors to become brutish. And we talked about what that was. Okay, pastors get prideful. They forget to give God glory, give God thanks in all things. They forget uh, who it is that saved them, why they got saved. And, and their whole world just becomes focused on worldly things, the three enemies, the world, the flesh, doing things Satan's way. They start messing with the scriptures. They start just ignoring the scriptures and doing things God, the world's way versus God's way. They become brutish. We talked about that. And when they become brutish, they stop seeking the Lord. The Lord's way. They stop seeking the counsel of the Lord. Oftentimes, prayer gets affected. Um, one of the things we didn't mention, I don't think, is that if you hold iniquity in your heart, uh, in the Psalms, if you want to turn to Psalm 74, it's where we're going to pick up on. King David in the Psalms talks about, if I hold iniquity in my heart, sin, like I'm holding on to it, I'm not letting it go, God will not hear me. So God, your prayers, when you go to try to seek the Lord, if you're holding sin in your heart, God's not going to listen to your prayers. He won't answer your prayers. Because you're holding sin in your heart. Mm -hmm. That can affect your way to seek God. But we talked about it. For pastors become brutish. What happens when they become brutish? They stop seeking the Lord. They start doing things the world's way. They start succumbing to the three enemies, the world, the flesh, and Satan. Okay? Mm -hmm. Therefore, and then we're on the third part, therefore they shall not prosper. For the pastors shall not prosper. Now we're going to clear up something. People think prosper, physical prospering is what this is talking about. Now for the Jewish people, I believe it's both physical and spiritual. But for today, for instruction in righteousness today, if someone's very physically prospering, does that mean that they're, doing the, they're in God's will? And they're doing what God wants if they're physically prospering? Turn to Psalm 73, 1. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such are of a clean heart. Every time I read through this Bible, brother, sister Christ, it always comes back to the heart. It always comes back to a heart issue. It's not a head issue, it's a heart issue. Are you hiding Jesus and His perfect written word in your heart and living for Him and looking for Him every day and living His word every day? It always comes back to a heart issue. Do you have a clean heart or do you have a dirty heart? Good fruit, bad fruit, or zero fruit. Those are the three types. Truly God is a good to Israel, even such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Why? Keep reading. For I was envious at the foolish. Now remember, brothers and sisters Christ, when it comes to the Bible, the Bible says a fool has said in his heart there is no God. So when it actually says the word fool, you're dealing with someone who's lost. They're separated from God. Okay? But when you see the word foolish, foolish, it means you have people that are acting like they're lost. They could be saved, brothers and sisters in Christ, but you start acting like the lost, looking like the lost, doing things the lost world's way, and you start becoming foolish. So if someone says you're being foolish, are you saying I'm not saved? I'm saying you're acting like the lost world. That's what the Bible's talking about. You're acting like the lost world. For I was envious at the foolish, talking about the Jewish people, that are God's chosen people. Some of them were acting like the heathens around them. They were acting like the Gentiles, bringing in false gods, and so on and such forth. For I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Wow, they must be doing something right. Look how prosperous they are. So some people will try to say these Babel buildings, these TV evangelists, men on... Uh, uh, on online, like doing videos like this, like I'm doing, Brothers of Christ, you've had men that'll tell people that they're prospering doesn't mean they're doing right, and then I've had a brother in Christ turn around and claim that because he's prospering physically, he must be doing something right. You fall into that trap, just like King David. Okay. 
for I, for I was envious. Some people say that Solomon wrote some of the Psalms too. So either King David or Solomon, but Solomon was the richest man. So I'm leaning towards King David. When you see the prosperity of the wicked, does that mean that they're in God's favor? That God's blessing them? Not always. It says the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Paul, if you listen to Paul, and when he preached, when he got saved, born again, started li uh, preaching the gospel and living a life of Christ, he went from living a great life, as a he was with the strictest sect of the Pharisees, he went living a, you know, a prosperous life, but when he got saved, he started living a life that was hard, full of hardship. He had to become weak. There was days that he talked about being despairing of life and death, that had sorrows, days where he didn't know if he was going to eat the next day. If he was going to make it through the week with food and raiment. There's times he was blessed. There's times that he went through hardship. But people and sometimes people will look at that and go, well, he must be doing something wrong in God's eyes. He must be, you know, God's punishing him. That's what it is. Because these wicked people, God must be blessing them. Look how great they are. They're strong. They're firm. Neither are their plagues like other men. That's not always true. And there are times where people, and i got to say this real quick, brothers, right? there are times, and I, I point this man right here, there are times where I went through the most hardest times in my life, I've said this before, that I've been through, it was because I made decisions apart from the Lord. I did not seek the counsel of the Lord. I decided to do things my way. So honestly, the hardest, hardest times I've been in my life that I went through as a Christian, born again Christian, was my fault. But there are there's still going to be times you've got to discern between the two, rightly divide the Word of God, and you've got to discern between the two. Is this hard time happening to me because I'm making wrong decisions apart from God and doing things my way and not God's way? Or am I choosing God's way, therefore... I'm not conformed to this world, therefore I'm going to stick out. And it might mean some suffering. It might mean that I have to give up some things, a cost, to serving the Lord and doing things God's way. But people see this and will think and get envious, thinking they must be doing something right. Look how physically prosperous they are. And we're going to get into what we're supposed to be focused on. Are we supposed to be focused on the temporal or the eternal? Things that are eternal. Got ahead of myself. Verse 6, therefore pride compass them about as a chain. <clears throat> Let that sink in. When, when brethren, I've noticed this with brethren in ministry. And like I said, this whole study is a warning the brethren who want to be in ministry and the brethren that are in ministry. When brethren are in ministry and they're poor, they seem to be more humble. They seem to focus on God and it's the ministry comes first. When they start accumulating wealth, they start getting prideful. Because it becomes less about God and more about themselves. Notice the correlation here. They're prospering. These wicked people are prospering. But one thing King David notices is, but what comes with that prospering, the worldly prospering, pride. Therefore, pride compass them about as a chain Violence covereth them as a garment. And the, when we get to the last part, it talks about the flocks, um, the, the flock. For the flocks of the pastor shall be scattered. You get men that get so prideful and so arrogant that they start causing division. Was pr only by pride cometh contentions. And contentions leads to division. The body of Christ dividing. Look at that. Violence covereth them as a garment. Pride comes in and it starts causing damage to the body of Christ. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. Once again, what Paul say to Timothy? With food and raiment, therewith be content. If you're going to be in full-time ministry, and I said I'm not full-time ministry, I'm part-time ministry. Full-time ministry is a house church, having a body of Christ there. Street witnessing ministry and so on. That's what being a bishop is. You're being an elder, but elder, bishop, deacon, once again, all three of those offices are chosen by the church. 
Okay, the, or, the elders are ordained by the church, not by yourself. There's men out there that think they can ordain, ordain themselves as, as elders. It doesn't work that way. I'm not an elder. I have not been ordained by the church to be an elder. I'm not a bishop. The elders haven't laid their hands on me and said, okay, this man loves the Word of God. He knows the Word of God. He's not a novice. We're going to lay our hands on him and bless him and support him as a bishop. Okay, I'm not talking about financial supporting. I'm talking about physical elders that, that approve a bishop. Okay, they're, they're, I don't know of any man that I watch and love, my brothers, that someone's, the elders have done that. Okay. But they have more than their heart can wish. The Bible says be content with food and raiment. We're going to get to that. Okay. But what happens when you start getting a lot of accumulating a lot of wealth? You get very prideful. Okay. Verse 8, then what happens? They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. Have we seen that among some of the brethren? That when they were poor, they were humble. But once they start accumulating wealth, they get to live their dream life, and they think they've gotten all this stuff. What happens to them? They start speaking loftily. Verse 9, they set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongues walk through the earth. Bible building people. Oh, I'm a King James Bible, who wants to say King James Bible believing? They're, they set their mouths against heaven. They start going against the true plan of salvation. They start attacking the Godhead of the King James Bible. The God of the King James Bible is God and the person of Jesus Christ. That's the King James, that's the Godhead of the King James Bible. They start attacking it. They start attacking the imminent return of Jesus Christ. That's, that's a fundamental do, major doctrine that's tied in with the catching away of the body of Christ. Looking for that blessed hope and loving the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What happens? They set their mouths against the heavens. They once stood for something. Like I said, this is for pa uh, pastors out there that they stood for something right, and then they're now part of the falling away. The Bible talks about the falling away is going to happen before the man of sin is revealed. What's preventing the man of sin from being revealed also is the body of Christ. He who now let will let until he be taken up out of the way. So we're preventing the Antichrist from showing up, but right before, the Antichrist, before we get to go home and the Antichrist shows up, there's also a falling away. And you see these men, they set their mouth against heaven and their tongues walketh through the earth. They start talking more about worldly things than they do about godly things. They make worldly things more important than godly things. But they'll still have good words and fair speeches. Right? They'll PWC. When they were in a standing position, they'll PWC some right things that they that, that's according to the scriptures because they're just parroting what they said when they were in a standing position. But now that they're in a falling position, anytime they try to branch out, they make a mess of the scriptures. They're just making a mess of things. What do they need to do? They need to repent and get back to their first love. And their tongues walketh through the earth. They need to realize that this world's not important. I'm here to be a light for Jesus Christ. I'm not here to live my dream. I'm not here to have all my rewards here on earth. You want your rewards on earth? God will give you your rewards on earth. And when you stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ, here's your penny. I remember Peter Ruckman. I keep mentioning him in this study because I've been watching a lot of his studies. Peter Ruckman talked about once where when he preached, he didn't think he was going to get any rewards for that. And they're like, why? Because he's like, because I get paid to preach. He gets paid to preach. That's why he was involved in so many ministries outside of just preaching in a Bible building. He wanted rewards in heaven. But he's saying he got his rewards down here because he was getting paid to do it. There's a lot of truth in that. Now, I'm not saying he won't get rewards. I still think he'll get some rewards for the preaching he did in the Bible buildings. But I understand what he's saying. If you're getting something out of it, you're getting your reward down here. The rewards he believes you're going to get the judgment seat of Christ are the ones where you did something down here and you got nothing out of it, one, or it cost you. Charity, self-sacrifice, true charity, self-sacrifice. But if you're getting paid to do something, okay, 
But what does it lead to? You got pride. When you start getting all this wealth, you start getting prideful. It starts changing your attitude, your demeanor. Have we seen this among some of the brethren? When they start, when they were poor, they were doing amazing and very humble. And it was 100% about the Word of God. It was 100% about ministry. It's a life calling. And then when they start accumulating things, wealth, it becomes a job. It becomes a career. All right? It becomes an income. And they become worldly. I pray that, like I said, the first person I hit up with this is me. Because God has blessed me here. I hit myself up and say, Lord, am I still focused on you? Is the ministry coming first? Is my heart still about you, Lord, and serving you and trying to get rewards in heaven and storing up rewards in heaven? Or am I getting too distracted by this world and things of this world? And there's times I have. There's times I have. So I'm wanting things down here instead of being content with food and raiment. Being content, Paul, uh, Paul says, being content with whatever state that I'm in. Whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be there with content. I hope I got that part right. <laughs> Look at the scripture. Verse 9. They set their mouths, they set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Doth God know? And is their knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are ungodly who prosper in the world, they increase in riches. That's not the kind of wealth you want. That's not the kind of prosperity you want, brothers and sisters of Christ, for today. Right? The Jews in the Old Testament, they did. They wanted land. They wanted to be able to farm the land. They wanted huge families. And they wanted to serve God every day and love God every day. But they also wanted to prosper physically as well as spiritually. And today people say, well, what's wrong with us wanting both? Well, today... In order to prosper physically, you've got to fail most often times, 9 out of 10 times, you've got to fail spiritually. You've got to compromise spiritually. So what's more important? You've got to make a choice. Physical prosperity or spiritual prosperity? 13. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning chastened. If you're truly saved and born again and you start falling into the, we're going to get into uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, go ahead and turn there, start falling into the love of money, God will chasten you to get you back on the right path. But one of the things about a brutish pastor is they'll think that um, physical prosperity is more important than spiritual prosperity. And they'll try to use that physical prosperity to justify then to try to hide the fact that they're not spiritually prospering. And they'll try to deceive you into thinking that all this physical prosper, that means I'm in right standing with God. No, 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 no. That's not true. First Timothy 6. And if you start envying, envying the wicked and how prosperous they are, Look what it says. Behold, uh, say verse, three, verse 13 of Psalm 73. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If you start um, envying the foolish and the prosperity of the wicked, and that's your drive, and, uh, that's your drive and, and that's where your passion is, and you're truly saved and born again, it's going to bring nothing but sorrow and pain. And suffering because you're going after the wrong thing and the Holy Spirit in you and your soul are gonna be in anguish because your flesh is trying to run you getting you to go after the wrong things 1st Timothy 6 we're gonna start in verse 3 we're gonna read all the way to 11 if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words King James Bible, for English-speaking people, it's God's perfect written word. They're wholesome words. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, the capital W word, the manifest word, and the written word, lowercase w. Okay, The words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which is according to godliness. God's way. I'm telling you, in these last days, doing things God's way... You're going to prosper spiritually. 
but you won't be that prosperous physically. Okay. According to godliness, he is proud. He is proud. There we go again. There's the word pride. You know the number one thing that destroys a man in ministry? When a pastor becomes brutish. When he gets so prideful. He is proud knowing nothing. What did we read up there in Psalms? How they talk, um, they set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues walketh through the earth. They know nothing. They're about worldliness. They're not about godliness when they get to this point. When they start turning against doctrine. When they, not, when they stop seeking the Lord. When they get prideful. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds. Be careful about that. That's why we talk about debate as a sin. If you realize you're talking to someone who's lost, and they're trying to get you to fight and argue over the Godhead, over the true plan of salvation, the Bible version issue, if they seem like they want truth, talk to them. But if you get to a point where it's like they don't want truth, they just keep asking question after question after question, and their intent is not that they want the truth, their intent is to get you derailed. To get you away from the truth. To distract you from doing good work for the Lord. You're spending all your time trying to convince somebody that doesn't want the truth. Perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds. And destitute of the truth. And here it is. Supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. When you start seeing all these men in Babel buildings or online, and they start getting to the point where it's becoming more about money, more about worldliness, and they start thinking physical gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. That's why a lot of people, I understand what some of the brethren are, are talking about, you know, the Babel buildings. If you're truly saved, you need to be coming out of the Babel buildings. If you wouldn't be in there if you're truly saved. I disagree to a point, and please hear me out. Please hear me out. I believe that there's some people that can get saved in these Bible buildings. And what it is, is they sit there and they're fighting that urge of traditions of men, rudiments of the world. And they're also taking time to re trying to reason with the, the elders of that Bible building, the leaders of that Bible building. They start reasoning with them through the scriptures. And they might fight it for a year or two before they come out of the Bible buildings and say, okay, enough's enough. They don't want to do things God's way. They are corrupt. I'm coming out of these battle buildings. It might take some time, okay? There's men with testimonies that after they truly got saved and born again, they have the King James Bible, they're in these battle buildings. It took them a few years to come out of the battle buildings. It just doesn't happen overnight. But I do agree predominantly um, in these battle buildings, I do agree predominantly, I believe most of them are lost. They're false converts, okay? They're just part of a club. And when they don't like that club, I have it written down somewhere else, we'll get to it. When they don't like that club, there's so many other clubs to choose from. There's just so many other clubs to choose from. But verse 6, here's the solution. When it says withdraw yourself, you withdraw yourself from someone that's like that. But how can you gain fellowship with that brother back again? Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. That's how you can get that fellowship back. That's the thing that gets me with some of the brethren that are fighting and causing division and everything. You can give up what's causing the division, but they won't give it up. It has no basis in Scripture. They can repent and get back to the first works, get back to your first love, and they won't do it. All they have to do is, but godliness with contentment. For this situation about not prospering, the pastor's not prospering, when they think it's physical prospering, but godliness with contentment is great gain. When you start envying those paths, those hirelings, the wolves in sheep's clothing that are in these million dollar Babel buildings and making good money and they have nice homes and car, nice cars and stuff like that. And you start emptying them, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. 
I've seen this among some brethren. What's the solution? But godliness with contentment is great gain. And having food and raiment, let us where therewith be content. But they that be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men into destruction and perdition. Now I have to stop there for a second. Brother says Christ, do not be deceived. You'll have men stand up there and say, well, you see that Kenneth Copeland. I'm not a millionaire like he is, therefore this doesn't apply to me. It's not about whether you have 50,000, 100,000, 1 million, 1 billion. It has to do with they that will be rich. I know brethren in ministry that they will compare themselves to people like Kenneth Copeland, who's a millionaire, but they wouldn't dare compare themselves to the average man that donates to their ministry. These Bible buildings donate to their ministry. Why? Because to the average person that donates to those ministries, those hirelings, those wolves in sheep's clothing, are rich. It all depends on who you're comparing it to, and it's, and it's deception. If I compare myself to a billionaire, I look great. But if I compare myself to a brother and sister in Christ that's living out of their car or on the streets, now how do I look? You see the deception. Good words and fair speeches can deceive the hearts of the simple. Right? Rich doesn't mean millionaire. Don't let them define what rich is. Rich means compared to who, who you're comparing yourself to. We used to say compared to third world countries, we're rich here in America, and we are. We're living like kings and queens. Okay? For they that be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and into many full, foolish and hurtful lusts. Look at America. Look. It's going to take some hard times to break a lot of these Americans so we can lead them to Christ. Right now it's almost impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God can break them. There still might be some, I still believe there's people to get saved because we're still here. But was drowned men in destruction and perdition. We're talking about pastors, though. They start leading people in the wrong direction. They start Their priorities start getting so messed up. And they start getting you to have your priorities like them and get you messed up. That's why it says, from such, withdraw thyself. When you find a pastor that gets brutish, that stops seeking after God, and... They're not prospering, and we're going to get into the true part of this, spiritually prospering. What are their fruits? What fruits are they producing in the, in the brethren that follow that ministry? Okay. When they start going the wrong direction, they're going to start leading as many people in that direction as possible. And that's why the Bible says, from such withdraw thyself. It's not about being mean. It's not about because we're to hate them. It's because that's supposed to be a way of getting them back on the right track. We don't support them in any way, shape, or possible. And we, and we let God deal with them to get them back on the right path. And usually it takes breaking them financially sometimes to get them to remember what it's like being poor, being humble, to get them back on the right track. Here it is, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, while while some have coveted after, they have erred, from the faith. Notice it says the love of money. It doesn't say riches, millionaire, billionaire. It says the love of money. I want this type of house. I want to live this way, Lord. And I'm not talking about a bad way. I'm talking about whether you want to live in the city, you want to live off grid, you want to live by the ocean, or I want to, I want a beach, a house by the beach, Lord. And all the houses around here by the beach are like million dollar homes. I want a house by the beach, Lord. And it's so like that's like is that a sin to want a house by the beach? No. But when you covet it, and God's like, that's not what I want for you, then it becomes a sin. You have erred from the faith. People think money, the love of money, wealth, silver, gold, it's just silver and gold. No, it's wealth. Physical wealth. Okay. It's the root of all evil. If some covet after they have erred from the faith, this is addressed to Timothy saying, hey, there are brethren that have erred from the faith. Why? Because they start getting into ministry for the money. It started out with, we're doing it for the Lord, and I don't care if I get a dime. If I have to work a secular, a part-time job, and do the ministry, 
I don't care. I'm going to do the ministry. If I have to live dirt poor and get the, and do the work of the Lord, that's how it's going to be. But over time, God blesses that man because he's humble. And starts blessing him and blessing him. And at some point, he can go the wrong direction. And it becomes about the money now. It's no longer about being a servant to the Lord and ministry and servant to the brethren. It becomes about money. And you see that a lot in the Babel buildings. You see a little bit of it online among the brethren. Okay? They have erred from the face and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We just read about that. If you're going to go after, if you're going to start envying these men that are prospering, the wicked, the prosperity of the wicked, uh, you're going to pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Because you're not going after what's good and what's true. Verse 11, what's the solution when you have the love of money? Well, we talked about that. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You have to get back to that point with godliness with contentment is great gain. And having food and raiment, let, therewith let us be content. But it says again in verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. If God doesn't want you living that way, then flee it and live the way God wants you to live. Okay? And follow after righteousness. If some blessing comes along, you get married, you have children. Uh, the American dream of, there used to be a house with a white picket fence, used to be the American dream. If that stuff comes, say, Lord, these are blessings. They're not necessities. I know brother in Christ who messes with the scriptures to try to justify how he wants to live. Not doing how God wants to live. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness. There's people in those battle buildings saying, you have to have this battle building. You have to have a nice suit and tie. And on and on and on. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience. You know my number one problem is patience. You say, what are you talking about? I keep telling the Lord I want to come home. And the Lord's like, I have you there for a reason. Don't you trust me? Don't you trust me? I'm wanting to catch the way the body of Christ to happen today. Now I'm supposed to live, the Bible says I'm supposed to live every day as if it could happen today. That's why the Bible says in this present world, looking for that blessed hope that he might redeem us. Might. Might. It might happen today. He's going to redeem everybody. That's not saying he's just going to pick and choose who he's going to redeem. He's going to redeem all those that are sealed into the day of redemption. But the might part talking about it could happen today. Are you living? For, are you doing this? But, oh man of God, are you following after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness? And God's trying to tell me, you need to be patient. You need to be more patient. I'm, I want that hot wood stove. I, I want to get it done because I don't know what's going to happen in the near future um, with the economy and everything in the world. And God's saying, trust me and be patient. And we're slowly trying to get that wood stove done and, ha and get it happening. And it's like, i got to be patient. Okay? Meekness. The opposite of pride. Meekness. Humbleness. Okay? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. We have pastors that have professed a good witness among many witnesses, and now they're going the way of the world. Brothers in Christ, you want to be in ministry? You cannot be in it for the money. And when you get into it, if God does bless you financially, you've got to not be careful not to fall into the trap of the love of money. I have to live at this level of income. No, you do not. Do you have food and raiment? Therewith be content. Therewith be content. Okay. Now, prospering, when it says the pastor shall not prosper, I had to get that out of the way. It's not talking about, the you look at the world and they're physically prospering, does that mean they're right standing with God? No. So what does it mean when it says the pastor shall not prosper? Turn to Matthew chapter 6 verse 19. Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. 
That's not what's, like I said, that's not what, what, it's talking about prospering. Lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. This is all temporal, that's why it's called temporal. It's all temporary. You won't have any of this in eternity. The only thing we're going to have in eternity is your soul and the Word of God. And whatever rewards we get at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what we're going to have for eternity. I'm not going to have this desk for eternity. I'm not going to have this camera. I'm not going to be online for eternity. Okay? All this stuff here, I'm not going to have it for eternity. Verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where, th where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Brother says, Christ, there will your heart be also. I'm going to go back to 6 for a second. But what it says right here, you want to uh, set up treasures in heaven? Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Be content with food and raiment, but godliness with, with contentment is great gain. For what we're talking about here. Okay? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you're envying the world and what the world has, your treasures are going to be in the world. And there's men that God's like, do you want your treasure? Brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ, God's going to look at you and say, do you want your treasures here on earth? Fine, you can have it. They're temporal. They're just temporary. Are you sure this is what you want? You want to sacrifice rewards in heaven to have things down here? Fine. You think God's going to fight you? He's going to warn you and warn you and warn you. But you want your rewards down here on earth? Fine. Brother says Christ, it's not worth it. And mainly for men in ministry, it's not worth it. You want a ministry that's profitable spiritually? You're going to have to learn to live poor. You're going to have to learn to be content with food and raiment. I've seen ministries fall apart because it went from being content with food and raiment to now they've got to have the world and do things the world's way. It's not worth it, brother says Christ. What happened to pastors? They become unprofitable spiritually. When they're not profiting spirit physically, they seem to prosper more spiritually. When they start prospering a lot physically, the spiritual comes down. That's my experience as in my lost life. When I'm looking back as a saved man, in my lost life in the Babel building system, that was my thing. Okay, that's what I've experienced. And even today, on ministries online, be very careful. Just because God is blessing you some, with some physical things, they're blessings. They're not necessities, they're blessings. But the work of the Lord is what's important. That's where the prosperity needs to be, hardcore. Not physically, in the world. 2 Corinthians 4. Jump over to 2 Corinthians 4. Second Corinthians chapter four thirteen. We we having the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we which remain shall be caught up with them. To be in the, with them in the clouds, to be with them in the air. And notice that it says, Know that he which raised up Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, this is an off subject for the Godhead, talks about how God the Father raised Jesus Christ up, then the Son of God the Father, Jesus Christ, raised himself up, and then it talks about how the, the Spirit quickeneth him. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, Spirit of God the Father, raised Jesus up. So what's going on there? The person of the Godhead raised Jesus up. But that's a, that's a rabbit trail. And shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. What's one of the things about a pastor becomes brutish? They stop giving glory to God. They start taking it for themselves. 
Verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but some brethren are. But Paul's saying, We faint not, but thou art, but though our outward man perish, this wicked flesh, this body of flesh is going to perish someday, whether in death or God will destroy it instantly and give us a new body to catch away the body of Christ. But this outward man is going to perish. There's some people who put a lot of a lot into their, their their you want to be healthy absolutely, but there's some what, like women putting beauty. They're trying to look young, even at 60 years old. They want to look like they're 18. You got men that are you know. They, when they start going bald, they start doing hair plugs and toupees and, and they're doing skin creams to try. They're now trying to look young and everything at 60 to 80 years old. They want to look like their 20 to 30 year old self and everything. And the outward man perish. Don't be putting a lot into the outward man to try to keep it looking young. You're going to get old. I'm getting old. I look at my hands sometimes. And I know this is just an old thing, but I look at my palm of my hands and I see wrinkles really bad now because I'm getting older and when I used to do this you go like this it makes you look like you have a young hand again because it stretches the skin out but there's times where I do this and I still start to see wrinkles I'm getting old okay the outward man perish you're young you're young but we uh, us old men and women we understand the outward man perish but be careful not to fall into the trap of trying to look young and hip and worldly it's not worth it but though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. That's why I pray every morning, Lord, renew my spirit every day. Help me get through this day. Help me focus on you. My mind likes to wander sometimes. Not sometimes. Every day. I don't I think I go through one day where my mind doesn't wander and start thinking of bad things. And I have to say, Lord, help me rein it back in. Put it in subjection. Put the flesh down. And say, no, I want to sing a hymn. I'm going to start talking about God's Word like a Bible study. I'm going to listen to God's Word. Watch a Bible study. Go for a walk and pray. Okay. I always talk about being renewed day by day. Verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Okay. When you get saved, you're going to go through some hard times. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Not compromising, no matter how hard life gets for you, not compromising. Following after those things we read in Timothy. Godliness. Okay? Meekness. Okay? Looking after those things. It's going to cost you down here. And you're going to go through some hard times down here. For our light affliction, it's a light affliction. Why does it say light affliction? Paul talked about despairing of life and death. So why does he say for our light affliction? You want to know why I believe he's saying that? Because compared to what Jesus Christ, our Savior, went through, what we're going through here now is nothing. It's nothing compared to what he went through. It's a light affliction. Another way to look at it is the reason Paul's saying this is because compared to eternity, compared to eternity, this is nothing. Keep your mind set on heavenly things, on eternal things. We get to go serve our great God and Savior in an incorruptible body, immortal body, and serve Him for all eternity. We'll never hunger again. Remember that song I love to sing about... Um, there's coming a day. It says, there'll be no sorrow there, no more sickness to bear, no more sickness and pain. I'm doing it wrong, but um, I know if I started from the very beginning, but there'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no, sh no pain, no more parting over there. Why? Because our, life, our, for our afflictions today are light compared to eternity. Our afflictions are nothing compared to what Jesus Christ did for us. What happens to a pastor that becomes brutish? They forget what Jesus Christ did for them. They downplay it. They forget why they got saved. They forget what he went through for them. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment... Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We're supposed to be earning rewards. What we suffer for Jesus Christ, the Bible says, if we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. 
But we suffer for Jesus Christ down here, for living for His Word, living for Jesus Christ every day. It's nothing to be compared with what God has prepared for us. Verse 18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Brother, sister, Christ, as a whole, are you worried about eternal things more than you are about temporal things, physical things? Are you worried more about your prayer life, your Bible reading life, your sanctification life, living for Jesus Christ every day, doing, living how Jesus Christ says you're supposed to live? The elder women teaching the younger women good things and does a list of those things. Men, you know, what you're supposed to be doing. Is that what you're worried about? Or are you worried about trying to live your dream life? Are you trying to worry about gathering wealth, accumulating wealth? Are you worried about, you know, I can't trust God to take care of us and provide for us. I'm the one that's, the Bible says a man that provides not for his own, he's worse than an infidel. I understand that. A man, if a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. I understand that. But do you trust God that he'll provide the work that'll provide food and clothing for you and if you have a family, family? Okay, are you trusting the Lord? When you're a man in ministry, God provides. You're to focus on ministry. God will provide the rest. Do you trust Him? Okay. For men in ministry, are you focused on the ministry? Or are you getting sidetracked by the world? Physical things of the world. I know some brethren who have. Okay. And they pierce themselves through with many sorrows. I see it. They try to act like, oh, I'm all happy and everything. But you can see the sorrow. It'll sneak through every so often. It'll sneak through. You can see the sorrow. 2 Corinthians 5.18, over one chapter. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Remember one of the things I told you about patience was on that list that we read in Timothy. I need to be patient. I want to be absent and be with the Lord, but uh, I'm present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor. So as I'm looking to want to be with the Lord Jesus Christ every day, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. God has us here for a reason, brothers and sisters Christ. And brother, brothers in Christ that want to be in ministry and want to be a good pa preacher, teacher, pastor someday, you need to realize that you can't become brutish. That the fruit of the ministry is what matters. I, I knew a brother in Christ once that he got so into money that he started to preach that he said that he took the, uh, a verse out of context and he was talking about how when he does Bible studies and he puts them out there and brethren watch but don't donate, it feels like he's casting pearls before swine. He totally took that verse out of context. So basically if you don't donate, you're a swine. He thought that when he puts out videos, the proof that it's effective and it's, do, it's working for the Lord is the donations. That's not the effectiveness. He's supposed to be looking at the fruit and the brethren. That shows he's doing the work of the Lord, the fruit and the brethren. Redounds to the glory of God. That's where his worth is. Is what I'm teaching reaching the brethren. Is what I'm saying to you right now, brothers and sisters Christ, is it helping you hide God's word in your heart and live for him every day and not be part of the falling away? Is there fruit? That's the true wealth of the ministry, spiritual fruit. Not donations. Not finance, like money and wealth, worldliness. Right. Is it okay to donate? Yeah, it is. But I'm just saying that brother in Christ forgot what the true wealth of a ministry is. It's the fruit, spiritual fruit, reaching people for Jesus Christ and His Word, getting people to get their eyes back on God's Word and living it. Those are rewards you get in heaven when you become a pastor. Verse 10, for we must all appear, why? For we labor that whether present or absent, we, that we may be accepted of Him. Why? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. When a pastor becomes brutish, their, their prosperity 
they start having bad fruit, worldly rewards. But the good starts dwindling. They're not being they're not prospering spiritually. They're not prospering when it comes to being effective and how they're being able to reach the brethren for the word of God or the lost world for the gospel. They become less and less effective. They become less, they start, they they don't prosper. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Remember it talks about being proud? We keep coming across that word. Pride, proud, proud. You know what pride does to you, brother says Christ? It makes it so you don't fear the Lord. So knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We try to remind you about the fear of the Lord. Where's your fear? If you're starting to produce some bad fruit in a ministry, where's your fear of God? Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf. That ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance... The world, the flesh, look at me. I must, I, I, I must, God must be okay with what I'm doing because look how well he's blessing me. Physically. They glory in appearance. They still glory for themselves. They take it from God and they're glorying in their appearance. Worldliness. And not in heart. There, it was flickering on me. Not in heart. Once again, we come across the word pride a lot, and we also come back to the heart. It's always going to come back to the heart. What's the heart condition? We did a study on this, how to have a perfect heart before the Lord. It's hiding God's word, which is perfect, and hiding Jesus Christ, which is perfect, in your heart and live in it. You live, you sh let Jesus shine through you every day, and you live his word every day. And you're looking for that blessed hope. That's what it means to live his word every day, because you're looking for that blessed hope. There are brethren that have turned their back on the blessed hope, and their life shows it. They show it. They're not looking for Jesus Christ to come back today. What are they looking for? They're looking for the Antichrist. They're, they're acting like post and mid-trib. They're looking for the Antichrist. They're looking for the Mark of the Beast system. They're looking at the uh, One World Order. But how do you sum it up? What are they doing? They're looking at the world. They've taken their eyes off Jesus Christ, and they're looking at the world. Now, the Bible gives us signs of the end times. So as you're looking at Jesus Christ and doing the work of Jesus Christ, you might pass something that, that's showing, hey, the mark of the beast system's coming up. You might pass something that says, oh, they're trying to bring about a one world order. But you need to not be distracted by that, and you need to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. That means the times we're getting closer to the end. We better get busy for the Lord. But those signs aren't meant to distract us, to get us to take our eyes off Jesus Christ, and all we're doing is looking at the world. Now the Bible says, Matthew 7, 20, whereby their fruits, ye shall know them. When you have a, um, a pastor that becomes brutish, their fruits go from being good fruits to bad fruits. And I want to give an example of this. The question is, what spiritual fruits are you presenting? When you get into ministry, and you start preaching the word, and you start being a servant, not a master, a servant to the body of Christ, Okay. What spiritual fruit are you presenting? What fruit do you produce in the brethren that you help the brethren to produce? That you motivate the brethren to produce? Okay. Here's a good ministry. Love of God's Word. When you start out, you start producing the fruit that you start producing the love of God's Word. This is the final authority, the King James Bible. It's perfect, God's perfect written word for the English-speaking people. This is our foundation on matters of faith and practice. And you have such a love of the Word of God. And you produce that fruit, and you have that, you produce that fruit in the brethren. That's what I hope I'm producing you, that this is the foundation, not me. This is the foundation. And if I'm doing different than this, this is what you follow. And when I say it, I mean it. I know a lot of you hear a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing that'll say it. Oh, um, it's the word of God, word of God. And it's like, but then they go off and do worldly things and preach worldly things and get you to go the world's way. And it's like, I thought this was your, you know what I'm saying? I'm getting ahead of myself. A pastor with good fruit is going to have a love of God's Word. Love of the appearing of Jesus Christ. 
love of the brethren. Love of being humble. And they pray hard. Lord, don't let me get prideful. Don't let me get proud. The proud look. Don't let me become uh, brutish. Don't let me become brutish, oh Lord. Uh, they have a love of sanctification. When God says, hey, that's not what I want for you, or that thing that in your life is sinful and wicked, get it out. Sanctification. Sanctification is done to please God. You have a love of pleasing God. Why were we created? To please God. Giving God glory and thanks in all things. Even when bad things happen, give God glory. Now, like I said, sometimes bad things will happen to you because you screwed up. You need to repent, forsake, get back to serving the Lord, and whatever comes, whatever happens, happens, and you give God the glory. But chastisement, Lord, you're doing this to get me back on the right path. I'm sorry I strayed from your word. I tried to do things my way, and you get back to doing things God's way. What happens when a pastor becomes brutish? Well, let's do the opposite of all that stuff. The love of tradition and rudiments of the world, the commandments of men, trump the Word of God. They go from loving the Word of God, it's the final authority in all matters of faith and practice, and now it becomes love of traditions and rudiments of the world. You get distracted by the world. And you get that appeal to do things the world's way. Looking for... The man of sin, mark of the beast, one world order. Instead of loving the appearing of Jesus Christ and looking for his coming every day with the life that you're living, you're too distracted by what's going on in the world. And you start... They always talk about how a, play, uh, a, a pilot, when they saw the mountain, if they looked right into the mountain, they'd start steering towards the mountain and they'd run right into the mountain. And I forgot what it's called, but that's what would happen. So when you start looking at the world all the time... What happens? You start going the way of the world. You start steering and you start going that direction. That's why the Bible says we're to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. That's why we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope with the life we're living every day. But what happens to a pastor that becomes brutish? Wealth comes in. Okay? Remember the fruits. When it says they shall not prosper, it's talking about spiritual prosperity. They start having bad fruits. Love of division. You got brethren out there that are purposely, purposely dividing the brethren, and to hide that they're dividing the brethren, they point the finger everywhere else. It's everyone else's fault. I'm not doing it. It's everyone else's fault. I have to look at myself and say, hey, what fights are worth fighting? Okay? And there's times where I gotta realize I had brethren correct me, said, hey, you made your point. Move on. And you're right. I made my point and I need to move on. Okay? But understand, this is worth fighting for. Worldliness is not worth fighting for. But you have brethren out there that are fighting for worldliness and they admit that it's worldliness. They admit it's traditions of men. And they're using it to cause division. They love division. The, the fruit of their ministry now is division. The fruit that used to be loving the brethren. being of the same mind and of the same judgment. What happens when a pastor becomes brutish, gets prideful? It becomes about me, myself, and I. They start causing division. Pride leads to contention, which leads to division. Remember I told you the number one Christian that's the most dangerous Christian today, truly saved and born again, is respecter of persons. So when that pastor that becomes brutish starts going the wrong direction, they follow him. And then you start acting like him. And you start making the same mistakes that he's making. One of the fruits, they love division. Bad fruits. Backbiting. Whispering. Slandering. Bearing false witness. Worldliness. Trying to justify sin under liberty. Trying to justify worldliness versus godliness. And they'll pervert the scriptures to do it. First, the scriptures would correct them, someone who's not brutish, a pastor that's in a standpoint. This corrects me. I'm supposed to be in subjection to this book. Then they go from that to saying, well, I can correct this, and this book needs to be in subjection to me. And that appeals to people. That man's doing it. I can do it too. So that's why I like following that man. Yeah. 
What are the fruits? The love of pride. Not humbleness, not meekness, pride. Pride is the number one thing that it always, you see it start out with pride. Pride and making choices that choosing the world over choosing the word of God. And when you get called out on it, your pride tries to defend you. You defend yourself with pride. The love of pride, justifying sin. Love taking, here's a big one, love taking glory. Another big one. Love taking glory for himself and he loves the praise of men. Brothers and sisters Christ, what are the fruits of the ministry that you're watching? I pray that the fruits of this ministry is the love of God's word. It's what I've always tried to push. Love of the appearing of Jesus Christ with the life that you're living. Are you taking God's word and hiding it in your heart? It's always a heart issue. Love the brethren. If I correct the brethren, it's done out of love. Like I said, I talk about it. It's not about tearing people down and destroying them. That's what the lost world does. It's about tearing down, chipping away those bad things off you, what you're doing wrong, so God can build you back up. Okay? Our, the love of the brethren when it comes to correction is to build you back up and get you on the right path. I want my fellowship back with every brother in Christ that I've wronged, that's wronged me, that's chosen to go the way of the world. I want them back. I want that fellowship back. But I won't compromise. They need to come back to the right path and start lining up with the scriptures. And they need to be forgiveness. They need to have forgiveness. There's times where I did wrong by brethren and lost fellowship. I apologized, but they didn't have love of the brethren. They didn't have forgiveness in their heart. They couldn't forgive me. And they went their separate way. There's nothing I can do about that. But I try my best to promote love of the brethren, not love of the world, not love of self, me, myself, and I. Love of the brethren. True charity is self-sacrifice. Love being humble. That's something I talk to the Lord all the time. Lord, am I being humble or am I getting prideful? Am I getting bitter? There's times I talk to the Lord and it seems like I'm starting to get prideful and bitter and anger. And the Lord has to call me down and say, hey, listen to yourself. You sound like you're whining and complaining. Like a little child. I'm like, Lord, you're right. And then he also says, didn't you give that to me? Whatever it is I'm complaining about. Yeah, Lord, I, yeah, I, yeah, I gave it to you. Well, then why do you keep trying to take it back? That's another thing to watch out for. Sanctification. I always try to, like I said, when you're looking for Jesus Christ and living a life of Christ, sanctification is important. You've got to be separate from this world. That's how you're a light to this world. If you look like the world, if you conform to the world, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. But if you're doing those things that are highly esteemed among men, trying to justify it, you're looking like the world. You're not being a light to the world. We're in the world, but we are not of the world. We're separate. We're supposed to be a light. We're not to conform to this world. We're not to love this world. We're not to be a friend to this world. We went through all those verses, I think. Or we will. <laughs> I do my best to try to promote that. And when there is bad fruit, and brothers see it, and they come and correct me on it, praise the Lord. Remember when I talked about wisdom? Uh, I was going through that in Proverbs, which is in my other Bible that we're going through. There's a chapter that talks about the wisdom of this world is, is likened to a harlot. And then it talks about wisdom that God will give. And it uses the word her for that wisdom. You can either choose the wisdom of this world and be part of a harlot, or you can choose the wisdom that God provides and be in Christ Jesus our Lord with the life that you're living, not just in words. Okay. Be very careful. Now, one thing I put on here in my notes is Babel buildings. Why so many in one place? Because they love division. They love separating the body of Christ. If you don't like, if you don't get along in this building, you can just jump over to that building. If you don't like that building, you can jump over that building. It's no longer conforming to one standard, all this being of the same mind and of the same judgment. It's, you can be as gods, knowing good and evil. And they promote division. When I was lost going to these Babel buildings, the Babel building I went to divided uh, twice and separated, and another church was built. And now you have two. And then the, this one 
divide it again in the future. Now you've got three Babel buildings. And then they divide, and there's another one here. Then they divide, and this one over here. Why is there so many Babel buildings? The people will look at that and say, look at all these Babel buildings in this, in this city. That means God is prospering. Then why is the world so wicked? If we have so many Babel buildings out there that are serving the Lord and doing things God's way, why is the world so wicked? No, there's only supposed to be, like I always tell people, in, in Birkings, where I live here in Birkings, Oregon, there should be only one Babel building, if a meeting, not a Babel building, but a meeting house. There should be one meeting house, one body of Christ coming together. That's how it's supposed to be. Not 50 million of them that are separated and, and fighting with this one and that one fighting with that one and, and fighting over worldliness and wolves in sheep's clothing coming and screwing up doctrine and screwing up the Bible and everything. What's all? That's Satan's plan. That's Satan's doing. That's not God's will. But they'll look at all these buildings and think it's prospering, it's prospering. That's not what it's talking about when it says a pastor will not prosper. Spiritually, those buildings are dead. They're just dead. And they're full of dead, they're full of dead bones, you know. Out where they look like white sepulchers, but inside they're full of dead bones. But because of this, the reason I'm going into this talking about division is because the last part of this message where it talks about for the flocks of the pastors shall be scattered. When you become brutish, you stop seeking the Lord, going for the world, and you won't prosper. Spiritually, you will not prosper. That's what we're supposed to look for, the fruit. That fruit won't be there. It's not about physical prosperity. It's about spiritual prosperity. That's what we're supposed to be looking for. Right. What's it going to lead to? Remember, this is for a pastor that was in a standing position, and now they're in a fallen position. They become brutish. What's it going to lead to? They're going to scatter the flock. The flocks of the pastor shall be scattered. Turn to John. John chapter 10. I'm trying to turn everywhere, <laughs> but it makes the videos very long. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good sheep giveth his life for the sheep. You know the number one reason I see in these Babel buildings that they split is because the pastors start fighting amongst themselves, or there's there's a scandal. Okay, uh, The battle building I was going to, they had the youth pastor, got caught with the uh, teenage girls. Uh, there's battle buildings out there you hear about the pastor stepped out on his wife. Pastor does spends money wrong. Oh, I just bought me another house, or I bought me another car, or whatever. Okay. They're not giving their life. One of the problems you'll see with these pastors, when they become brutish, when they become brutish, they don't give their life for the sheep. God says, I'm going to have you as a, as a shepherd to these sheep, a pastor to these sheep. You're supposed to give your life for them. It's not supposed to be about me, myself, and I, and I want to live this way, and I want this, and I want that. It's about, are you going to give your life for the sheep? And some brethren started out that way. And now, in their fallen state, you look at them, they wouldn't give their life for the sheep at all. It's all about me, myself, and I. But he that is a hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scatter the sheep. They're too distracted by the world and worldly things. And what happens is, I've seen brethren that choose the world over ministry. The ministry, they always try to say, the ministry comes first, the ministry comes first. Who are you kidding? Look at these battle buildings. It's a job, it's a career, it's a business. In the end, it's about me, myself, and I. They wouldn't give their life for the sheep. I know some brethren online that's become the same way. It's all about me, myself, and I. They wouldn't give their, they, they would in the past, but they wouldn't give their life for the sheep today. It's all about me, myself, and I. They choose the world over fellowship with the brethren. Thirteen, the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not 
for the sheep. Praise the Lord that some of the brethren I know haven't gotten that far. But they're heading that way. That's the direction they're going. They've become brutish. They're heading that way. They're, they're causing division in the body of Christ. And they're causing the, the sheep to scatter. And they're not showing love, caring for the sheep. They're showing caring for themselves. Matthew 7.15 we read, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward they are ravening wolves. These are false converts. But remember what we read in there. Foolish versus fool. Not in here, but in the passages before. Foolish versus fool. Fool has said in his heart there is no God. Someone who is foolish is acting like a fool. Doesn't mean they are one. It says that being foolish means that you're acting like one. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward they are ravening wolves. What happens to a pastor that becomes brutish? He starts acting like hirelings. He starts acting like wolves, like the wolves in sheep's clothing did. I've seen this in a ministry where he used to attack the right things, the things that the wolves in sheep's clothing did and the hirelings did. He would attack that with the scriptures, I'm standing for the word of God, and now that person's doing the same thing they did. He's acting like them. Acts 5.38. Acts 5.38. What happens? The flock gets scattered. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel of, or this work be of men, it will come to naught. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you can start out in ministry and having such a love and passion for the Lord that it is the work of God and God will bless it. Good fruit. He'll bless it. The flock might grow a little bit or a lot. He'll bless it. But when you stop focusing on Jesus Christ and His Word and you start going the way of the world, it's no longer doing the work of, uh, it becomes the work of men. When it, become, when it was the work of God, God was blessing it spiritually. When it became the work of men, it falls apart. And some people get confused with that, saying, well, if it falls apart, then it was always the work of men. Eh, not always. There are brethren that become part of the falling away. There's a lot of men out there that are wolves in sheep's clothing, Babel buildings, men here online, wolf in sheep's clothing, and spiritually they come to naught. They might look like they're... They're physically prospering, but spiritually they come to naught. Okay. But there are men that start out good, and they are spiritually good, and they're profiting spiritually, but they come to naught. Why? Because they took their eyes off Jesus Christ and started going the way of the world. Romans 16, 17, come to naught. Don't. Be like that, brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't want to come to naught spiritually. I want to make sure that you're still sticking to the Word of God. Words have meaning. God chose words for a reason. Make sure you're looking for that blessed hope of the life that you're living. Living. you got your eyes on Jesus Christ. You're hiding Jesus in your heart and His Word so you can be a light to the world. Remember two types of testimonies, verbal and physical. How you live your life for Jesus Christ is a testimony for Jesus Christ. And what you say is a testimony. And you need to have both. There's a lot of false converts out there that have the words, but they don't have the life, the action. And they're creating false converts. And when they create a false converts, that's another roadblock for us. That's another wall we've got to tear down to try to reach them for the real Jesus Christ. You need to be both. Words and deed. Be a light for Jesus Christ. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. You have brethren turning their backs on the true plan of salvation. They got saved off repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. But now it's just, you know, it's just, you only believe, only believe. They turn their back on, there's brethren that turn their back. They started out being a King James Bible believer, and now they're using Bible perversions. 
They start out believing in eternal security and then they get part of some club, some wolf in sheep's clothing comes in dot with false doctrines and talks them out of their, uh, their assurance of salvation. You've got men that they stood for the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, and like I said, looking for that blessed hope, the imminent return of Jesus Christ goes hand in hand. You turn your back on one, it's only a matter of time before you turn your back on the other. And you've got brethren that turned on the whole thing and went post and mid-trib. You have brethren that turned their back on half of it, and their life, they live their life as if they're going to go through that time of Jacob's trouble, but in words, I'm the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ. But they're worldly, and it's all about the world. They don't have their eyes on Jesus Christ. The doctrines which ye have learned, and avoid them. When you have pastors that become brutish, and they start going, they stop seeking the Lord, and start doing their own way, we're to avoid them. Why? Because the Bible says, those that are without, God judgeth. We're to avoid them. We're to try to correct them. One of the things that the brethren have a problem with is actually going to somebody one-on-one -on -one and talking to them with love through the scriptures to correct the brother in Christ. They don't want to do it anymore. They, catch a, they see a brother in Christ that might be in the wrong, might not, but might be in the wrong, probably is. And when you go to correct them through the scriptures, you're supposed to correct them with love. But you're like, I see he's wrong, I'm just going to kick him to the curb. How quick do we kick brethren to the curb? Too quick. Have you gone and talked to that brother? Oh, this brother in Christ, he wronged me and, and what he did and everything. Did you go talk to him? I ain't talking to him and I am the pride, 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 bitterness, anger, hate, hate, pride. That's all you're hearing from him. Did you go talk to him? No. Then don't talk to me about it. Go talk to the person who hurt you. Go, prior, go talk to the person who wronged you through the scriptures. Go gain thy brother back. Don't whine to me about it until you've talked to him. And if you tried talking to him and it didn't work out, then come talk to me. Talk to the Lord first, but then come talk to me. But how many people, brethren, that were being taught, just kick them to the curb? It's a lot easier just to kick them to the curb. Don't try to talk to him. Don't try to gain your brother back. Don't try to correct or rebuke your brother face to face. Oh, no. Just kick him to the curb. But this is avoid them. Absolutely. But make sure when it comes to our brother in Christ that once stood for truth. This is talking about these ministries that you come across and they're already teaching false doctrine. They're already messed up to begin with. We're talking about pastors that once stood for absolute truth and they start falling away. Go talk to them. Go talk to them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. This is talking about those wolves in sheep's clothing. They serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Brothers in Christ, when you have a pastor that becomes brutish and he starts falling away, it's going to cause division. Because you have those respecter of persons that I'm that man is the captain of my salvation. And we try to remind those brethren that hey, that man is not the captain of your salvation. It's Jesus Christ. But I'm of that man, so I'm going to keep following him. And then you have brethren that say, Jesus is the captain of my salvation. This is my final authority. i got to follow Jesus Christ. So that man goes this way, and Jesus says, go this way. i got to go this way. And what that man does is he causes division. He scatters the flock. Some people get tired of the whole argument between the two of them, that they just depart from both of them and go this way to another person talk about scattering the flock. Okay? But by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. Be careful. Not, I always say this. If you don't want to be simple, brother and sister Christ, you need to know this book. You need to hide it in your heart. It's not just memorizing. It's living it. So when you see a brother in Christ start to fall away, God will show you, hey, that brother's falling away. When you see a wolf in sheep's clothing, God will show you it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's going against the scriptures. When you see a pastor that's become brutish, you can try to help him through the scriptures. But you won't be, see, be deceived by his good words and fair speeches. 
1 Corinthians 1.10 reads, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same things. We talked about this a lot. You speak the same things, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together, perfectly joined together. So there's this big teaching that goes out there. I hear it from brothers in Christ. I heard 33rd book say it. We don't have to agree on everything. When it comes to this, it says we're supposed to be perfectly joined together. Now, I don't agree with everything that everyone teaches, but if I had a chance to talk to somebody like Peter Ruckman or 33rd Book or whoever, I'd try to talk to them. I'm not saying that we need to blow up on every little thing. There are things that are not worth fighting for, and the Bible talks about us striving about with words to no profit. There's some brethren that are striving about words to no profit. Okay, They need to stop doing it. It's that simple. But it says here we're supposed to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We are supposed to be on the same page. People say, well, that just talks about major doctrine. Where does it say major doctrine in there? We're supposed to speak the same things, that there be no division among you. Oh, let's just talk about major doctrine. Oh, let's just talk about the gospel. Let's just talk about, you know, the Bible version. Should we, also, we all need to stand and say, this is God's word. That's it. Even if we all have differing opinions on what God's word says, it doesn't matter. Just as long as we say this is God's perfect written word. No, it says we need to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Period. No exceptions. That's why I'm against that teaching that we can agree to disagree. When you have a pastor that becomes brutish, one of his arsenals is he'll start pushing, we can agree to disagree. There are things that we don't, we don't have to agree on. We don't have to agree on everything. So he can keep the people there. Okay? These Babel buildings, it's a big push in these Babel buildings. Why? Because they want to keep the people there and donating. We've got to keep everybody happy. So we'll just tell everybody... But regardless of what we say, we don't always have to agree on. You don't have to agree on the pre-time of Jacob's trouble. And, and we don't have to agree on instruction of righteousness. And we don't have to agree on whatever. We can agree to disagree and just all come together and get along. You're going to have no pro fruit. It's going to be zero profitable fruit with that attitude. If that becomes a big attitude. So far, some of the brethren, it's a small attitude, but it's... it's in the Bible buildings, it's a huge attitude. They want everybody to get along. We just need to go along to get along. So you need to shut up so we can all go along and get along. When God says, hey, that's wrong, your whole heart screaming with the Holy Spirit, that's wrong with their teaching up there and what they're pushing up there. Oh, no, just keep your mouth shut and don't cause wakes, don't cause problems. This says we're supposed to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Brother in Christ, you want to get into ministry, or brethren out there that are getting into ministry, you need to be promoting that we need to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. If you want good fruit, if you want unity, not division. What causes division is someone comes in with the false teaching of we can agree to disagree on anything in the Bible. The world, yeah. The Bible, no. They come in and say that we can agree to disagree. So then you've got this group believing this, you've got this group believing this, you've got this group believing this, and eventually it's a powder keg ready to explode. I've been in the Babel buildings. I've seen them split multiple times. That's what that produces. That's why there's so many Babel buildings everywhere, because they have that attitude, that false teaching, that antichrist spirit teaching of we can agree to disagree. We don't have to agree on everything. And the church splits and splits and splits and splits. That whole mentality causes division. You know what causes unity? That you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. But that's not hardly preached anymore. In fact, that's attacked by brethren. Not just lost people in these wolves and sheep's clothing and these battle buildings. This is attacked by brethren. Because it's just, in these last days, the falling away. The biggest reason I think the falling away is happening is because of that teaching. There's things we can agree to disagree on. Then you become the final authority and not God's Word. And we're not supposed to be in unity when it comes to God's Word. 
Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What causes division? What causes the, the sheep to, to scatter? We don't all line up together. We're not, the Bible talks about, I don't know if I did this first, but the Bible talks about how Paul says we're supposed to be striving together. You can't strive together if you all have differing opinions and we can agree to disagree. You're not striving together. That doesn't cause unity and help us to strive together and make it possible for us to strive together. If I'm wrong on something, I'm wrong on something. Come correct me. Do it with love through the scriptures. And with the, what I mean by love is with the attitude, I want to get that brother back on the right path. Not destroy him, but to build him back up. That's what I mean by come to love. Because some people don't get that what that means to correct and love. Correcting and love doesn't mean being nice and patting you on the back and everything. I can be straightforward. I can be blunt. And it might be brutally blunt. But the love comes from that my goal is to get you back on the right path and to build you back up. When you come to correct me, you better have the same attitude. Because if your attitude is to destroy me, people put up a shield. And I'll probably end up putting up a shield too and I won't listen. Because you're here to destroy me. Not build me back up. 1 Corinthians 3.1 And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. This is to the Corinthians. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. One of the ways I believe that it will help a pastor not become brutish, just one, there's lots of ways, meekness, humbleness, being on the same page, this comes first, not the world, but I believe one of the major things that really will help you brothers in Christ that want to get into ministry or that are in ministry is sometimes you forget the milk. Sometimes you've been preaching and teaching for years and years, you forget the milk. You forget why Jesus saved you. You forgot the, what you came from, the lost world, to be in a new creature in Christ Jesus. You forget the milk. You get so stuck on the meat that you forget the milk. And then you stop the meat, and you start doing the world way. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walking as men? Pride. Who's the king? I had a brother correct me. Who's the king of all pride? I said father, but king of all pride. Satan. Who's the lowercase g god of this world? Satan. Who's trying... Who, the lost world's way is pride. Are you not carnal? Pride leads to strife, divisions, envies. Are you not carnal? And walk as men. For while one saith, I'm a Paul, and another, I'm a Paulus, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. The milk. Who saved you? I didn't save you. You weren't baptized in my name. I wasn't crucified for you. Who saved you? It's not supposed to be my way. Whose way is it supposed to be? The basics. Bible believing, God fearing. The basics. The milk. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything. No, but I did this and I did that. You're nothing without Jesus Christ. And some, of, some brethren are forgetting that. Oh, I did this. And I, you didn't do squat. God did. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth. But God that giveth the increase. God is everything. You give God the glory. But brother says Christ, what's going to keep you from becoming brutish? What keeps the flock from scattering is that we're of one, the same mind, the same judgment. We need to go back to the milk sometimes. Sometimes I go back and listen to salvation messages. You say, well, why? You're already saved. To remind myself of the milk. To remind myself who I was before I got saved. So I don't go back to being that way again. The Bible talks about how you can try to resurrect the old man. You're not to do that. 
when when you have men and and uh, in, in the, the flock, men in ministry start resurrecting the old man. They start going and doing things the world's way, and not God's way. It causes the flock to scatter. What causes sheep to scatter is respecter of persons. Is one we already talked about that how they become respecter of persons, and you have those that aren't respecter of persons. And the respecter of persons will go with that man. The ones that aren't respecter of persons, they trust the word of God. And God says, this is the way to go. He's going the wrong direction. That's what causes the split. When that person falls, the sheep scatter. Some go with him and do his things, his way, the world's way, because it's appealing to a lot of people, fleshliness. And there's brethren that say, I'm going to stay true to the Bible, and they have to go the other direction. Also, the church of God is not operating as it should with elders. You know what would also prevent splitting? They're not operating as they should with elders, bishops, and deacons. You know the number one way that you see a man become brutish, and that's the reason I'm always fearful to the Lord and praying to be part of the house church, a meeting house? All right. People say, what do you say, meeting house? Well, a if you have to buy a place to do a house church, as long as it's not 501c3 and you don't invite, invite lost people into it. Okay? They had meeting houses in the old, old, old days. Um, you don't call it a church building either. It's a meeting house. But God and His design to keep men from becoming pastors, from becoming brutish, to prevent division as much as possible, it can still happen, but to prevent it as much as possible, he set up a system where you're supposed to have elders, you're supposed to have more than one bishop, and you're supposed to have deacons. And what destroys a man, what I've seen the most that destroys men, is battle buildings that are one-man show, it's a one-man show, or men online, online that are a one-man show. I'm the only Bible-believing preacher out there online. They become a one-man show. They get puffed up. They get prideful. They become brutish. We're not supposed to be a one-man show. I don't want to be a one-man show. We're in the last days. It's tough. It's very tough. I don't want to be a one-man show. But one of the things I believe is hurting the body of Christ is these ministries. There's a lot of one-man show ministries. And that's not how God designed it. We need to get back to doing things God's way. Start putting together house churches, even if it costs you. I'm not saying you have to move a million miles, but if it means moving, if it means getting a job that pays less, but you get to be part of a house church, we need to make some sacrifices to go back to doing things God's way. Okay? And maybe God, has, like I said, I do believe God has us where He wants us sometimes, and then sometimes He wants us to move. Okay? But more than anything, I see brethren fighting, living the way they want to live, where they want to live, and it's not what God wants. How many of us, brothers and sisters, would, I would give up everything I have here, except my, this, this is one thing I'd never give up, but I'm talking about worldly stuff, this place, this, this area, I love this, the atmosphere over here, as far as the weather and everything. I love this place. I'd give it all up to be part of a house church. In a heartbeat. But you have brethren out there, it's like, I don't want to give it up. And they won't ever do a house church. For, two, for that reason, and the second reason is because they love being the one-man show. They love having all the authority and power. There's no accountability. There's no accountability whatsoever. God set it up for a reason. You have elders that judge in the church. And the Bible says that he that's least esteemed is who you choose to judge in the church when it comes to elders. When there's a problem in the church, they go before the elders. Problems I've had with brethren, and the brethren have with me, we would go before the elders and present our, our case, as you as it were. And the elders that are least esteemed, they're supposed to be men that, that are um, not appointed. What's the word? My brain freezes sometimes, but it'll come to me. But you have elders that are ordained. Ordained elders that are least esteemed among the church. Thank you, Lord. They're least esteemed among the church. They're picked and chose because they love God's word, they're living right, and this is everything, and their life shows it. They're hiding it in their heart. And they get chosen, and when you have a problem among the body of Christ, they go stand before the elders. When there was a problem in Acts about the Jews trying to bring in, bring the 
the Gentiles back in, in the circumcision and the laws of Moses. They tried to bring them back under the Levitical laws. What did they do? They met with the elders. Right. Uh, deacons. I'm sorry, bishops. You have more than one bishop. Why? Because then you don't have that respecter of persons mentality. Sometimes it might still happen, but for the most part, if you have three or four people, let's say there's four weeks in a month, you have four preachers and you preach once a month, and it cycles through, it's kind of hard to have a respect of persons. It might still happen, but for the most part, it helps limit it. But if you have that same person that preaches all the time, and it has to be that one person, I'd give up preaching three, three times a week to do things God's way. There's supposed to be more than one bishop. There's supposed to be more than one deacon. It's called accountability, and it's physical, a physical church. There's no such thing as an online elder. There's no such thing as an online bishop. There's no such thing as an online deacon. You can have a house church and put some videos online, absolutely. And for that house church, you're a bishop for that house church. You're an elder for that house church. You're a deacon for that house church. But when it comes to online for the whole world, you're not the bishop of the whole world. The whole body of Christ all over the world. It doesn't work that way. That's the world's way. That's Satan's way. Okay? That's technology way. That's not God's way. Okay? The one, the one man show tends to rule in these last days, and it does. And like I said, I've also seen battle building split where they had the pastor and they didn't have an assistant pastor. It was just the pastor. And when he got used to being the one man show in the battle building I was going to, he used to be the one man show. And when they finally, uh, it was Foursquare Ministries. So when Foursquare Ministries sent an assistant pastor to work beside him, they fought each other because he's so used to it. it's my way or the highway, the one man show. And they fought each other and they both split and they had to send a whole new pastor period to start running that battle building. That's how bad it was. We're not supposed to, and the, the battle building I was raised in it was a one man show. There's no elders, there's no deacons, and just one bishop. One man show. What happens when you become a one-man show? You're going to wind up, it's, it's almost guaranteed, you're going to become brutish. You're going, to have, you're going to start struggling hardcore with pride. I don't know one brother in Christ that's in online ministry that, that's like a one-man show, and they don't struggle with pride. I keep praying, Lord, keep the pride down. Keep the pride down. I don't want to get prideful. I want to be accountable to brethren, but I need that physical accountability. And you're only going to find it in house churches. Right. Two things that keep a pastor in line. They keep him from being brutish. The fear of the Lord. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see, I'm laughing because it's the fear of the Lord. It's so, it should be simple. That should be, that's milk. That's not meat. That's milk. What got me to get saved? The fear of the Lord. I don't want to go to hell. Why do I give my life to Jesus Christ? Because I either give my life to Jesus Christ or I give my life to the world and go to hell. Give my life to Jesus Christ and go to heaven. Come to him as a broken sinner or say, I don't care what Jesus says or God says about my sin. I love my sin and I'm going to continue in it and I'm going to choose the world. But hell kind of struck a tune with me. And I was a professing Christian at the time. It really struck a tune with me. What if I am lost? I have no foundation. I was using four or five Bible perversions at the time. I have no foundation. I've heard the gospel preached so many different ways. There's no final authority. It took the, the Bible version issue to get me to the final authority, to get me to the true plan of salvation, to get me to drop my pride and go about to establish my own righteousness to get saved. But it was fear. I don't want to go to hell. But this is Christ. What about you? Was it fear? Nowadays, they're trying to take hell out of salvation. You don't have to warn people about hell. They're trying to take sin out of salvation. I heard a brother in Christ say that uh, when he quotes uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, he keeps saying how that Jesus died according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the, the third day according to the scriptures. 
Now, did anybody notice anything wrong with what I just said? I left out a very important key part. What did I leave out? What did that brother leave out? How did Christ die for our sins according to the Scripture? They're taking sins out. Oh, it's just how Christ died according to the Scriptures and rose again the third day. They take hell out of it. They take sins out of it. And it's just believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what happens? You, be, you wind up believing in vain. You take repentance out. The fear of the Lord, what I've noticed when a pastor becomes brutish, it's because they stop fearing God. They start getting puffed up in their own wisdom and their own pride and their own power and authority and they become very prideful. And they don't have true accountability and judgment. Remember it says they, they stop seeking the Lord. They don't have true accountability. Because this is not what they're following. It's the world's what they're following. It's their flesh of what they're following. They've been deceived into doing things Satan's way. Pride. Father of lies. The lust of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning. Lust of the flesh and lies. Remember what it said in Jeremiah 10, 24. You can turn back there if you want to, but Jeremiah 10, 24, it said, O Lord, correct me. Oh Lord, correct me. Accountability and judgment are the two things that will pe prevent so a pastor from getting brutish. It's the fear of the Lord and true accountability and judgment. Oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment. Not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. And God, when God pours out his wrath and his anger on this world... In the time of Jacob's trouble, he brings a lot of this world to nothing. The Bible says, if I have not charity, I am nothing. Self-sacrifice. Oh, Lord, correct me, but with judgment. I don't care what it costs me. Lord, correct me with judgment, but not in thine anger. Job 28, 28, we read, Job 28, 28. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. To depart from evil is understanding. But the fear of the Lord is wisdom. It starts with the fear of the Lord, brings in wisdom, and it gets you to depart from evil, which is understanding. The fear of the Lord. Proverbs Proverbs 11.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever, giving God the glory. You corrected me, Lord. Praise you, O Lord. I went through some hard times because I screwed up, and you corrected me, and you got me back on the right path. Praise you, O Lord, giving God glory and thanks in all things. Fearing God. Not fearing what's going on in this world. There's some brethren that have, they have ministries that's 100% based off of the world. The world. The world. Look at the world. Look what's going on in the world. Uh, we need to get back to looking at what Jesus wants for us. And living a life of Christ. Not what's going on in the world. Don't get distracted by what's going on. The fear. Remember, we're not given a spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind. I, I'll hopefully remember the third one. There's three things there. Of peace, love, and a sound mind. Maybe those are the three. I hope I'm getting the right three. But we're not to fear the world. We're to fear God. And trust God knows what he's doing. And let the world do what it's doing. And we need to stay focused on the Lord. And living for Jesus Christ. And the ministry of reconciliation. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but, the fool, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools. Lost people. So once again, why do you start act when you stop fearing God, you start acting foolish. You start acting like a fool. You start looking like a fool. You start acting like the lost world and looking like the lost world. I mean, I can quote this till I'm blue in the face to some of the brethren out there who know who I'm talking to. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God, but they don't care. They want to look like the world. They want to act like the world. 
Go for it. I can't, I, I can't go that direction. I fear God. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. you seeking God. Fearing God first and then you seek Him. What happens to a pastor who becomes brutish? He stops fearing God, gets very prideful, gets puffed up, takes glory for himself, takes the he wants the praise of men, he becomes worldly, he stops fearing God, he stops seeking God, he starts doing things the world's way. What does that do? That leads him to being not unprofitable spiritually, and it leads to the division of the body of Christ, the, the flock scattering. Proverbs 15.33 says, The fear of the Lord is the, is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. It's humbling to fear the Lord and to abide by His instructions. It's humbling. What happens when you get prideful? I really don't need these instructions. Maybe I can make up my own instructions. Maybe I can do things my way. And you become a brutish, a pastor that's brutish. Isaiah 11, 2 says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. Brothers and sisters of Christ, when I got saved, it became about Jesus Christ. I want to please God Almighty, which is Jesus Christ. God the Father, which is Jesus Christ. I want to please Jesus Christ. And when I start steering from that heartfelt desire, the fear of the Lord brings me back. I want to please God. Not my flesh. Not, I do it in order. Not the world. Not the flesh. Not Satan. I want to please God. And this is how you do it. Hiding God's Word in your heart. And living it. Living for Him every day. Isaiah 33, 6, we read, And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. I feared God, and God saved me. He humbled me, and I came to him broken, and he saved me. I fear God. I fear his reprisal. For me as a saved man, chastisement. Use the right word, chastisement. The lost world should fear his wrath and his anger. At one point, I feared that. I didn't want to be part of his wrath or his anger. Remember what Jeremiah 10, 24 said, O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, chastisement, as a father would a child, it says in Hebrews, as a father would a child, his love for his child, he chastises him. That's what it's saying here, O Lord, correct me with judgment. Not in thine anger, like you would judge the lost world, lest you bring me to nothing. There's that fear. Brothers and sisters in Christ, be careful who you follow and support in the sense of uh, make sure they line up with the scriptures. Make sure there's good fruit from the ministry. But mainly to the pre the pastors out there, the preachers and the teachers, make sure that you don't become brutish. Make sure you don't fall into that trap. That you start causing more problems in the body of Christ than you are doing good things for the Lord. These last days are perilous. We are seeing the falling away. I said this, wow, it's like every year it just seems to get worse. I said this Three, four years ago, I said, we're seeing people drop like flies that once stood for the truth and would stand for this. And now, we're, in these last days, I see them dropping even for the ones I thought would never, never be part of the falling away are becoming part of the falling away. And if it can happen to those brethren that I highly esteem and care about, if it can happen to them, it can happen to me. It can happen to you, brothers and sisters Christ. Once again, I'm trying to encourage the brethren who want to get in ministry and the brethren that are in ministry. This is the final authority. God needs to come first, not the world. God needs to come first, not your flesh. God needs to come first, not Satan's way, which oftentimes links up with the world's way. 
You can't be prideful. You gotta get that pride out. You gotta be humble. There has to be accountability. Everything that we talked about in this study. So brothers and sisters of Christ, please understand, mainly for the brethren out there that want to be in ministry. I started with myself first, and I went through these things and talked with the Lord and said, Lord, am I having a problem with this? Oh, I need to be more patient. Uh, Lord, I need to, when I give something to you, I need to make sure I give it to you. I need to make sure that I don't get prideful, that I don't get puffed up, that I don't have an ego, that I'm not above correction, that I'm doing things God's way. You got a problem with the brother in Christ? You go to him and talk to him one-on-one -on -one unless he's broken fellowship with you and he won't talk to you. If he will talk to you, go talk to him. Those doors are still open to some of the brethren that are causing trouble in the, in the body of Christ and attacking me. The door's still open. I haven't told them I won't talk to you. I've opened the door. I'm here. Right. Don't become a brutish pastor. So the worst thing that can happen to a man is he goes from standing for absolute truth and going to be a, a brutish pastor. He's saved, praise the Lord. But it's the worst thing I've seen happen to a saved man. When you go from being a light for Jesus Christ to looking and acting like wolves in sheep's clothing. To looking and acting like hirelings. It's the worst thing I've seen happen. So brothers and sisters of Christ, please, I pray that you follow along and you understand the importance of this. I'm doing this out of love. I judge this person first and I'm doing a warning to the other brethren that are in ministry and want to be in ministry. Don't become a bruised pastor. Don't get puffed up. Don't ever stop seeking the counsel of the Lord and doing things God's way, not the world's way. And remember, prophet, the prophet you're looking for when you get into ministry is spiritual, not physical. Don't ever fall into the trap of treating the ministry like it's a career. It's just a, a paying job. It pays the bills. No. You need to be focused on the fruit. What's the fruit of your ministry? What, what fruit are you producing in the brethren? That's what matters. And if you fail all these three things, guess what's going to happen? You're going to cause division in the body of Christ. And you're going to cause the sheep to scatter. And you'll have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ. Just as I'll have to answer for it if I do it. So, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.